it looks to me like the announcement of an NFL team in London is going to be imminent. It's going to happen within the next 12 to 18 months. Are you a football fan? Are you a Super Bowl fan? Are you a fan of the history of the Super Bowl? You're going to like this conversation with Dennis Denninger. Dennis and I go way back when I was at college at Syracuse. He was there after a storied career as a television producer. He spent 25 years at ESPN producing live sporting events, six different continents, tons of countries, huge, huge events. So he knows from the broadcasting side of things, from the media rights side of things, how leagues work. He's also a Super Bowl historian and has authored a new book called The Football Game That Changed America. Dennis believes we're close to an NFL announcement of a full-time team across seas. So listen to this conversation, and remember to subscribe to the channel by clicking on this button below me. Without further ado, Dennis Denninger. So we get to Super Bowl three, and then Super Bowl four. How significant is the Chiefs' victory over the Vikings to make it an even 2-2 before the merger? Super Bowl IV is a milestone, and I talked to Jerry Eisenberg uh, from, uh, you know, the, New the Newark newspapers, and he covered the first 52 Super Bowls, one of the media who, who was in there for all of them. And he said most people don't realize that Super Bowl IV was this real landmark in that it was the first one where there were more than hometown fans coming into New Orleans that became to be this corporate event, similar to how the, the Kentucky Derby had been. You brought your best clients in, that kind of thing. And they saw a real interest in, okay, we're going to make this an event because it had become, all right, we're on equal playing field here. And if the AFL team can win, then there's more suspense and there's more going on. That Super Bowl four was a real turning point for the NFL. What was the moment that the NFL and Pete Rosell realized, hey, the train's coming and we better jump on. We cannot crush the AFL. They're here. We might as well absorb them. That that could not have been met with unanimous approval around NFL owner circles. So what was it that kind of broke the dam there for the NFL? Again, American business principles at their finest. The NFL teams were starting to pay way too much for players because there was an AFL draft and an NFL draft. And players, when Joe Namath got $427,000 for his four-year deal, you had players like Frank Ryan was the, the quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. And he, he says, you know, if this kid who's never played a game is worth 400000 I must be worth a million. So it started to escalate the salaries beyond what the, the NFL owners wanted to, to have you know, be dishing out. Um, there's a great story in the book about Floyd Little, and he was part of the first combined draft. And he complains about his parents not having him born one year earlier when he could have made a whole lot of money in the in the competition <laughs> world. And you know, I've got some good quotes from Floyd. God bless him. We, we miss him. But Floyd Little was in that first class. And instead of getting 400,000, he got, you know, five figures way down a whole lot less, which was what the owners wanted. So the owners were willing to, okay, we can make this happen if we can combine a draft and if we can then basically monopolize the salaries. Mm, the late Floyd Little was a Broncos legend, pro football Hall of Famer, Syracuse legend around the SU program and was a, was a wonderful ambassador for the school and for the program for a long time. And now has unfortunately passed away. So tell me when it became bidding on the Super Bowl as host cities? Because as you said, it was a very small, tight group of cities that Pete Rosell basically said, it's here, it's here, it's here. When did cities start going, no, no, we want it, and get into a rotation? That was after Super Bowl four, And when they showed, okay, there was interest there. And after Super Bowl three, the TV ratings jumped. All right, this is going to be a competition. There is going to be suspense in this game. And the television commercials went up by about 40% in their prices. So it really started to escalate right, right after Super Bowl four. And then, all right, this is going to be a draw. We're getting corporate visitors. We're going to get more than the hometown fans to come to our city. 
then this is going to work for our city. So that's right there is when you started to get more bids and, and more stadiums being built with the Super Bowl in mind. Now we get to the 72 Dolphins, and this is an undefeated team, and they're going for perfection in the Super Bowl against Washington. I'm wondering, at that point, is that one of those crescendos in, in American sports history where, yes, the NFL is big, and yes, the Super Bowl is growing, but now we have something historic happening with everything on the line in this massive game. Where does that mark in terms of kind of milestone fence posts in American sports history? Anything that generated headlines for the NFL and the Super Bowl was important, and that generated a lot of interest. And it just it came on the heels of ABC's launch of Monday Night Football which was in 1970, which proved to the NFL that night games could get a big audience. So 72 Dolphins, 73, pretty exciting times. 1978, the NFL finally moves the Super Bowl to a night game. And all of that publicity led up to that. And the first night game, again, the ratings were about 20% higher than the previous year, because during the day on a Sunday, People found other things to do. Sunday night was the largest viewing audience night of, of the week, every week. So you put the Super Bowl on a Sunday night. It was also the first indoor game. It was inside the Superdome, and the lights had this magical look to them. Um, it really, it again, yet another level. And then 1970s, the Dolphins in their Monday night football, and then the launch of the, of the night game were, were real... They were a real transition period for the Super Bowl. Whose idea was Monday Night Football? Was it Rune Arledge and ABC and the TV people, or was it the NFL people led by Roselle? Actually, the NFL had started doing night games a few years earlier, but they weren't televised. Hmm. They did a few night games to see if they could draw a crowd. And there's in the book, there's a lead up as to how this happened. Um, so the NFL was doing this, and... And Rue Narledge saw, all right, this would be a great idea. We should get this on ABC. And he started a series of lunches in New York with Pete Rosell, trying to pump this up. And, and there's a really good, he gets this, he thinks he's got the whole thing all stitched up. And then there's this turning point and Pete Rosell says, no, 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 uh, you know, we got to do this and this before we sign with you guys. And it was like, oh my goodness, I've been working on this. So it, what was competing on the other networks on a Monday night had, um, had, a, had a, um, an impact on whether it was going to be there. And ABC happened to be the third rated network at the time. And whatever they had on Monday night was not outdrawing the other two networks. So it was, okay, we're going to take, we're going to take a flyer on this. And it ends up working overnight, right? I mean, was it a, was Monday night football an overnight sensation back in 1970? It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, the bowling leagues, that played on Mondays changed their dates to Tuesdays. Uh, there were so there, here process servers. This is a good one. A process server trying to find somebody to serve a warrant to knew that if they did it on a Monday night, there was a better likelihood of the person being home. <laughs> Huge impact. because because it's the first ever regular season standalone game, right? I mean, I guess outside of Thanksgiving games, and I'm not sure were those nationally televised, aside from the playoffs and the regular season, everything happened on a Sunday against everything else. So if you wanted to sit down and watch one standalone game, there was only Monday Night Football as of 1970. It shows you the value of breaking out of what you, we get into a rut. The NFL saw themselves as a Sunday afternoon product. Sunday afternoon. That's why the first 12 Super Bowls were all played on a Sunday afternoon. They weren't night games. But if you break out of the rut and say, okay, let's give this a try, then, all right, there's a lot more opportunity, a lot more possibilities. So it, it was a huge sensation from the beginning, and it made a big difference. The Super Bowl has not obviously not gone back to a day game. Now, my my I'm projecting, though, you know, we've got this week, we've got coming up, the, another uh, set of the beginning of the international series in, in Britain. And it looks to me like the announcement of an NFL team in London is going to be imminent. It's going to happen within the next 
12 to 18 months. And if that were to happen, the next step would be do a Super Bowl in London. And if they did a Super Bowl in London, it would have to be a nine o'clock game there. So it could be a four o'clock Eastern time and it could be a 1 p.m. Pacific. And then if they do a London game, it would return during that game. It would return to a Sunday afternoon game. This is a bold proclamation here, Dennis. You think of the next 12 to 18 months, we will hear the NFL say we have a full-time team in London? Absolutely. Absolutely. After this season, we will have completed 36 regular season games played in London since that international series started in 2007. That's the equivalent of more than four full seasons being played in London. Every single game has been a sellout. And the NFL wants to see this sport grow beyond our borders. They really want to see gridiron NFL style football become a, an international product. So they've been working on these. Um, there's a, an international players pathway program this year. Uh, they had 11 players come out of that. Five of them are from the UK. They've also got this global program that was working on global markets. 25 different teams have been assigned to, to 19 different cities and countries to generate fan interest and, and cultivate commercial opportunities. So all of these things are fitting together. And the one key that hasn't been talked about, but what I talk about in my book is the return of supersonic transport aircraft. By the end of this, by the end of this decade, we'll be flying back and forth to London in three and a half hours. And if you can do that, well, that's like flying from Boston to, to Miami. You could make that team into an AFC East team with no problem whatsoever. Well, so would you assume that it would be moving an existing NFL team or creating an expansion team in London? I would recommend against moving a, a current team. I think you don't want to have any kind of baggage associated with that team. You don't want to have any hard feelings within the NFL. I, I just personally, but they haven't asked me, you know, they, they're not on the phone to me asking, right, you know, right. um, but my recommendation would be you get a British owner. You don't import an American owner. You don't import an American way of doing things. Every NFL team thrives on its local roots and its local character. There isn't any other team in the NFL than Buffalo where people jump off their pickup trucks and land on folding tables, right? But in Buffalo, it's it's a great thrill. <laughs> you, you know, the, the Steelers, you got your terrible towels. There's a, there's this um, local, local character that builds up around these teams that makes them more valuable. So I, I think that that's what, that's what I would recommend. They may decide that, you know, okay, it's better to have an established team go over there. Obviously the Jacksonville Jaguars Jaguars have been the team that's played the most. And this year they're playing back-to-back um, -back weekends. They're playing on the 13th and they're playing on the 20th. It's, you know, they're staying in London uh, to play games. And one of the other things that part of the strategy is that Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, where the first two of these games, the 6th and the 13th of October are being played, that was built to NFL specifications. They, there is no changes needed to the building opened in 2019. It's almost identical in size to State Farm Stadium in Arizona, which has already hosted three Super Bowls. And I think here's another bold prediction. I think that if the NFL announces that there will be a London team, so if they announce it within the next year, it would take three or four easy years to get it set up. During that time, we start to see these SST airplanes flying and the, the, the super factory to build them was completed in Greensboro, North Carolina this June. And the company Boom Supersonic already has 130 orders for these planes from American, United, and Japan Airlines to be flying these planes all over the place. The maximum capacity, about 80 passengers each. So if that all happens, I would see, all right, you get a London team. And what happens? You've got a new team. you got a new stadium. You get a Super Bowl. So I think that within five years or so after putting a team in London, it would host a Super Bowl, which would make this NFL football much more of a global presence. Yeah, I think the problem is, though, that the Jaguars have these designs and plans of expanding their Jacksonville Stadium, and I don't think they, they want to move suddenly after an 
investing all that cash into their stadium to London. And I don't think the NFL needs a team out in London to put a Super Bowl there. I mean, I know that that's the qualification at the moment, but don't you think that the NFL easily could just say, yeah, we're going to go to London for a Super Bowl, even if we don't have a team there? No. Uh, you know what? They've got this this routine, this protocol, let's say, that if you're an NFL owner, you get to host team games. They don't hold any games at the at the Rose Bowl anymore. The Rose yeah, but the Rose Bowl is a dated stadium. They, they, they're not going to play a Super Bowl at right. a stadium. That's but I'm just stadium. using it as an example of a stadium that is not the home stadium of an NFL team. So they'll only, they'll only play Super Bowls where because then it's, it's basically a reward to an owner. And if you reward this new British owner who's got an expansion team in London, that's that's another major point that I don't I don't think that they would play a Super Bowl over there because it would it wouldn't be part of the natural progression. But I mean, what team aside from the Jaguars are you going to up and move out of the NFL to put to London that wouldn't create a mass hysteria here in the States? That's why I say I think it should be an expansion team. I don't think it should be a move. But then you have to add a second team more than likely to get to 34 teams in an even schedule, an even an even yep. number of teams. Yeah. Yeah. So then there has to be a second expansion team, you think internationally, or a second expansion team that's here in the States? I, I'd say probably States. Uh, I don't think that they're at a point in any of the inter other international markets, but they're working hard in Germany. They're working really hard. And I, I'm, it's obvious from their strategy that the NFL wants to expand the the it's regular season games. It's regular franchises to more places than just in the United States. And if they were able to, in the next, say, 20 years, develop four or five teams that are in on the European continent and who knows, maybe even, you know, in, in Asia, you could get that. That could be your another one of your divisions. Or, you know, and then that could contribute it. You could rework the, the playoffs. All sorts of things could lie ahead. And, and fear of change should not, um, you know, should not hurt the NFL's choices. They, they've always wanted to, how do we make this bigger? How do we make this more of an international sport? They, I think they look desirously at, at soccer, which is, it's an international sport and it's played all over the world. And, you know, the NFL is not going to get there right away. But it's been working hard since even where the World League of American Football was 30 years ago, 1994 it started. But it was a developmental league. It was not a league where the, the big-time players, the best players, and the best teams were playing. And that's what has happened since they started the International Series in 2007. So you could foresee a future the next 20 years where there's five international teams? Why not? Why not? <laughs> oh, dreaming big. <laughs> That's right. That's what you got to do. <laughs> Let me ask you about some interesting anecdotes, factoids from Super Bowl history. One of the things that I love most, we touched on the Superdome in 77 being this kind of like breakout, wonderful place for the Super Bowl to be hosted, bright lights, prime time. But it had missed a chance the first time around to host because the stadium wasn't done. They had given the game to New Orleans but they had to play Tulane Stadium. How embarrassing was that when they realized the stadium wasn't going to be done for the game? That was pretty embarrassing. And Tulane Stadium was not up to snuff. And a lot of the writers and Jerry Eisen told me about complaining about playing in this in this stadium. Um, but once it, you know, once you're doing the first indoor game, the first night game, that 1978 game, all of that was forgotten. And it's like, okay, this is a whole bold new frontier that we've hit here. What about the MetLife Stadium game, outdoors, cold weather stadium? Was that met with resistance around the NFL owner circles? You know what? The owners of the Giants had built a new stadium, and they had been owners since the early days of the NFL. Um, and that's when, when you talked about owners being rewarded Super Bowls, the, the owners said, okay, we're going to do this and we'll just hope against hope that we can get decent weather. Um, that was a pretty bold risk. Um, and that's back in still in the day when teams were bidding for the Super Bowl. Several years ago, the NFL changed this process where they don't let teams build, bid for Super Bowls anymore. They have a group that goes out and they 
purposely target cities where they want to be. And ever since that committee took over, you haven't seen any cold weather games. You haven't returned to Minnesota. You haven't seen another game in Indianapolis, certainly not in Detroit. Although, you know, Super Bowl 40 was the first one I covered for ESPN Digital. And the people there were great. It just there wasn't a whole lot of outdoor activity that you could do in Detroit. One of the things that I want to point out, the average temperature at the um, MetLife Stadium for that Super Bowl was 40. It hit 48 degrees that day. Well, the average temperature in London in February is 49. So if they're going to play a, a Super Bowl, you would have pretty roughly the same kind of climate. That we just got to keep coming back to the Super Bowl in London, huh, Dennis? That just that is the, the absolute. You know what? That's it's in the book. It's in... <laughs> so that's interesting, though. Do you think that that Super Bowl scared the owners? Because by the way, the whole week leading up to that game, it was frigid here in New York, and the day after there was a snowstorm. Do you think that spooked the owners away from a cold weather Super Bowl outdoors again? Yes. Okay this point we have made we have paid our dues we have paid our tribute to the the owners of the giants and we're going to put that in the past we're going to go back to pete rosell's original concept for the super bowl was it would be played in a destination city it would be played on a neutral city where you could plan for years in advance you could promote the hell out of it because everybody knew where it was going to be you can't do that for the nba finals you don't know until, what, seven to ten days before the games, before the series starts, where it's going to be played. So you can't be promoting local events and all the rest of that. Uh, the NBA has a much better opportunity to do local promotion when they, they're hosting the All-Star game because they plan the All-Star game two, three years in advance. They know that so that they put on bigger promotions locally. Um, so it's, it is, it's not something that the, the owners want to do with moving this the Super Bowl to less than destination cities. And there's what? also this, you know, there's these cutoff points is that how many hotel rooms you got to have in your area to be able to host the Super Bowl and all the rest of those things that that require that are required for such a major event. Widely regarded as one of the best stadiums in football is in Dallas. Why is the Super Bowl not returned to Dallas? That always seemed curious to me. You know, I'm not. They don't let me sit in on those meetings. Um, and um, maybe, maybe you could get into one of them, um, or put a listening device in. But you know, they had such. <laughs> such hey, anything's possible with technology. For goodness' sake, we're going to be flying at the speed of sound again. <laughs> um, you know, they, it was snake bitten by the. I was at that Super Bowl 45, where the you know the snow slid off the roof and people were injured, and they had the whole fiasco with not having enough stands in there and 1200 people who paid for tickets didn't get to sit and and all the rest it was it was not the optimal success you couldn't point to that as okay this is such a success we got to do this again i'm sure that it will one of these days and you know and maybe again in tribute to an owner because that can be a destination although it, you know it's it's halfway between dallas and and um Fort Worth. It's basically in Arlington, Texas, and it's across the street from one of the largest Walmarts in the world. So you look from that stadium and look out and, oh, look at all those shopping carts. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure that Walmart does not have a role in them not getting a Super Bowl, but it was was not a palm trees destination. You know? Fair. That group of, of guys that have gone to every Super Bowl together, we see them you know, over the years profiled in places like Sports Illustrated by ESPN, et cetera. How many of them are still going to every game? They've got to be, they've got to be up there in years now. Yeah, it's dwindled. I think it's just a handful. I think it's maybe three or four of the originals, which is it's a wonderful testament to the success of this event and its engagement of an audience. It's drawing people's interest and again, making it a destination. These folks made it a destination event before Super Bowl IV. You know, they were, okay, we're, we are diehard fans. We wanna see this. Um, and then, then they started to ride the wave. Oh my goodness, this has become a huge event. Um, I think it's, it's wonderful for any sport the you, you in you go to the Boston Red Sox and there's 
there's a, a little lady who's been going to every Red Sox game since, you know, since 1948 or something, you know, they, these are great stories. And that all plays into the local character, the local history of these, of these local events um, in their cities. And then it adds to the importance of a Super Bowl when you've got people who care enough, care that much about it. Chris Fowler wrote the, the forward to my book and he tells a great story in there about how the Super Bowl became important to him as a kid. Let me ask you just big timeline. We know that back, let's just say in the forties and fifties, baseball was everything. College football was bigger than the NFL. By the time we get into the meat of the Super Bowl era, the NFL has surpassed baseball, college football, and become America's biggest event. When do you think that transition happened? If you were looking at the timeline of the Super Bowl, where was it where they intersected and then you saw the NFL jump over Major League Baseball? Very much media-related again. In 1960, when the AFL debuted, the AFL could be seen nationwide on ABC. 1960, NFL games could not be seen nationwide. NFL games were local products because the NFL was established before television. It was established in the era of radio and radio only covered a local area. So your media deals were with the local radio stations. As TV came on, the NFL teams just well, we're going to do a deal with the local television stations and create a, our own little network around our city. So you could not watch an NFL game nationwide. You could watch your, your local team play, uh, you know, at when they were away games, but they would black out when there was a home game. So the, the ABC games on, on for AFL didn't do that. So immediately... Pete Rozell said, we have got to, owners, hey, owners, you've got to abandon your local deals. New York was making 10 times more money on their media deals than Green Bay was. If the AFL had not merged with the NFL, it's very likely that football would not have survived in Green Bay, Wisconsin, because they weren't getting anywhere near enough dollars to pay for talent, to pay for anything that you need to support a successful team. So the, the, actually the arrival of the AFL and this, all right, this competition, the very next year after 1960, Pete Rozelle <clears throat> said, we have got to get uh, approval for, so we can do internet, so we can do broadcasting na nationwide. And what, what came up it was one of the landmark deals is called the, the broad, the, uh, the, uh, the broadcasting act, the broadcasting act of 1961, and that allowed for local teams, which were locally owned, to then group together as a monopoly and do a television deal that would be across the country. Previously, you know, if you're the Cleveland station and you're not a CBS station, well, how come we how come we can't continue to do a deal to, to show the Browns? Well, wait a minute. Some, somebody in New York at CBS says we're going to do a nationwide deal that takes these rights away from you. So they had to override these antitrust laws. It gets, it's really interesting. And it's, again, it's in the book. It's, it's a very interesting story. So 1961, 1961 was that turning point is, oh, now you could see AFL and NFL games nationwide. And now it's something that people in their homes, by 19, 1960, 87% of American homes, 90, over 90% of American homes had television. 10 years earlier, 8.9% of American homes had television. Wow. So television became this huge presence in people's homes and the media connection. And if we can see it, we can tune into it on, on, a, on a Sunday. And now we've got a choice of two games. That's where football moved past baseball. That's super interesting. Wow. I did not realize that. See, that's the type of stuff you get in this book, the football game that changed America, how the NFL created a national holiday by Dennis Denninger. Dennis is a veteran of television, sports television, sports communication, and is leading the, the troop at Syracuse University, my alma mater, and done an amazing job with the students there. 
every year, Super Bowls and Radio Rows and everything. So he is definitely entrenched in the sport, in the game of the event. So this book is really cool. It is available right now, Amazon and everywhere else that you get your books. The football game that changed America. This is really awesome. Dennis, thanks so much for joining us. This is great. Good luck with the book. Thanks a lot. It's been a delight. It's great to see you again. You too, Dennis. Thanks so much. Bravo. Hey, before we let you go, Dennis, I wanted to just reset the question about how important branding of the Super Bowl was, okay? I just want to redo that question. Is that okay for you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Three, two, one. So we know the story about Lamar Hunt naming it the Super Bowl after the Super Bowl, the toy. But Pete Rozelle is a marketing guy. And so who did he know that the original very wordy NFL, AFL championship, world championship needed to be changed? Who was the impetus behind really changing it? You know what? The, the media played a huge role because from the beginning, the tickets, the programs, Super Bowl one and two say, AFL versus NFL world championship game. The media had no room for all that stuff in a headline or when you talk in, in common conversation. If I were chatting with you, Damon, and saying, hey, are you going to watch the AFL versus NFL world championship game? <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't be saying it. So the media was calling it the Super Bowl from the beginning. And actually, Lamar Hunt, I, I got a chance to meet Lamar Hunt when we were working. I was working at ESPN, and we helped launch the Major League Soccer for the first time on television. And, and Lamar Hunt was one of the owners. And he was always this self-effacing, kind of quiet man who really was a great thinker. And when he proposed doing calling it the Super Bowl, he sent a note to Pete Rozelle saying, Hey, you know, I thought I was watching the kids play and, and maybe this Super Bowl might be a, a good one, but I'm sure that we can come up with a better term. You know, he wasn't taking credit for, I'm sure we can come up with a better name. Well, they didn't come up with a better name. And Pete Rozelle hated, hated super cool, neat, groovy, all of these empty superlatives that were floating around the air in the 1960s, partially due to Rowan and Martin's laughing, partially due to our, our culture, you know, everybody was using these words. So he hated it and he wanted it to sound like it was, this was this golden, this premier event. So it's going to be a world championship up there. Well, everybody in the world was calling it Super Bowl. So by Super Bowl three, he relented and the owner said, you know, we can market this a whole lot better. And the, the both of the networks that were going to air Super Bowl one, which was a great deal in that and AFL and NFL NBC and CBS were both going to promote the game. They were promoting it as this is going to be a Super Bowl. So the the owners saw, all right, by Super Bowl three, um, that was one of the things that Pete Rozelle agreed to. But he also said, you know what? It's got to have Roman numerals. Mm. Because Roman numerals will make it sound more prestigious. Mm. Like it's got history to it. So yeah. you put a Roman numeral after it, you know, like right. if you were after your shows, if you were doing the <laughs> VA and, you know, and IV, you know, I've been teaching this course now <laughs> in society for 14 years at, at number 10, I started using Roman numerals <laughs> so it, last this past spring. It was Super Bowl in society <clears throat> X IV, you know, by 14. So the, the Roman numerals helped uh, allay Pete Rozelle's fears that, that super would make it sound too empty as an, as a superlative. That is such a great anecdote because if you really deconstructed super bowl, Roman numeral insert Roman numeral here, it is totally like quirky, weird sixties corniness. It feels like, you know, if you really thought about it that way, but in the moment, I mean, now we just take it for granted, like it's just the way that it is, and it feels very natural. But I could see that at the time, if it's super is attached to like the Batman TV series, or as you said, laughing or anything like that, that feels cheap. You add the Roman numerals, that feels significant. You add the two, and it's kind of a weird Frankenstein idea, but man, does it work? It works so perfectly in, in today's society. Our cognition of it, everybody everybody recognizes it, and none of the other leagues have gone to it. Nobody else right. calls their final right. a Super Bowl, you know. There's yeah. the World Cup, right? 
So, and the NBA, NBA finals has adopted this, you know, golden font. And so, okay, we want to make sure everybody knows that this is special, but it's not the super NBA, you know, one of these right. days, maybe when it's a global NBA, they'll, they'll just probably call it the global NBA. Yeah. And nobody uses Super Bowl. Super because Super is so associated, as you're right, with the NFL. Yeah. And Roman numerals, you'd be laughed out of the building if you started saying like NBA Finals 16 or NBA or Stanley Cup Finals 108 or something like that. Man, yeah. Come on. What do you, but it, it works so well for the NFL. It's so interesting. One of the things I think people will enjoy in the book is that the last chapter is my prediction for Super Bowl C, Super Bowl 100 in the year 2066 and what things we could expect to see, how we could expect to see the game, how we can see it presented, uh, the entertainment surrounding it. So I think that you'll, in, if you read through the first 11 chapters, you get to chapter 12, you get rewarded with what's going to happen for Super Bowl C. That's the payoff right there. Yeah. Check it out.